What a wonderful name it is. Amen. What a week we've had across this nation, sometimes around the world. Amen. But thank God for the name of Jesus that is a strong and mighty tower that we can run into. How many of you noticed a new sign out there when you came in? Doesn't that look nice? <laughs> I wasn't able to be here when they put it up the other day, but when I pulled in the first time, I thought, ah, yep, new life, new life in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And thank you so much for all of you that donated to make that possible. Amen. We want to share with every person that walks in that door, we want them to remember that there is new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Are you getting comfortable now? I've been running around here sweating bullets for a church because the air conditioning was out. One of the belts broke. He, he, he's going to, he'll get me for this. But Jason, thank you again, brother. <laughs> I found a belt and he put it on and we're up and running again, thank God. Well, I want to thank Pastor Henry, too, for sharing that awesome message last week. There were seven professions of faith last Sunday in the altar service. That's an anointing. Him, Pastor Bill, different one's been helping me out. It's, it's that season of weddings. We, I've been doing weddings. <laughs> and those guys are great, and thank you for helping as well. But I'm ready to preach this morning. I've only got a little while. I'm going to try to finish the message I started three weeks ago. Amen. So if you'd stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning, if you have your Bibles and want to turn there with me, it's Deuteronomy chapter 1. We're looking at verses 9 through 11. I started talking to you about added growth in the church. Deuteronomy 1 verse 9 says, I spoke to you at that time saying, I'm not able to bear the burden of you alone. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold more than you are and bless you just as he has promised you. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne again this morning thanking you for the power that there is in corporate prayer. You said where three or more would agree is touching anything according to your will, Father. According to your word, your wisdom, your grace, your sovereignty, that, Lord, it would be done. And, Father, we just lift up our prayers and our hearts this morning, Lord, for, especially for the families out in Las Vegas, Father, that lost loved ones and those that are injured. We pray that your divine hand and healing would touch those that are injured and suffering. We pray that you'd touch the broken hearts of those that have lost loved ones, Lord God. And, Father, just put your arms of love around their families, around their lives. I ask that you'd help your church touch them, help them to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in that area. Help them to minister, Lord, and to extend your hand, O oh Christ our Lord, in those situations and circumstances. And Father, not there only, but God, touch the hearts that are here in our midst and across this land that, Father, are hurting this morning. We pray, God for an outpouring of your spirit across this nation upon your church, Lord. God, we need to shine in these dark times, and these dark hours, Lord. When the enemy comes in like a flood, your word declares that you will raise up a standard against him, and your standard is your church anointed of the Holy Spirit, filled with your power, your grace, and your love. And Father, help us to be all that we need to be in this hour is my prayer. Father, build us up this morning on our most holy faith. Help us to pray in the Spirit. Help us to receive your word that increases our faith and our understanding. And Father, help us to be mighty arrows in your hand, I pray. That's my prayer this morning. Father, add to all of the churches daily such as should be saved. And Father, bring in a great harvest in this time is our prayer. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody sit. Amen. You may be seated. You're looking good this morning. Thank the Lord for the little bit of rain that we're getting. I was in the car the other day, and I was listening to Christian radio, and I heard one of the announcers come on and said one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. He was talking about what went on 
out in Las Vegas, and he said, you know, I really want to know the background. He said, I want to know the background. I want to know what their life was like as a child. I want to know what effect, you know, the things around them had on them, what they were going through. And then when he got to the end of that, he said, not of the person who committed the crime. He said, we know that, that evil reigns in the heart of men, and it's nothing new, and it happens all the time. He said, I'd like to know about those heroes, those people that covered other people's bodies. How do you raise somebody like that? How do you have a father of three who runs around in peril of his life helping other people? I just share that with you because it's so easy for us. We always want to look at the negative and the evil. We forget about how good God is, and God has people everywhere, amen, that he is living through, glory to God. I started talking to you a few weeks ago about added growth because this was really a blessing of Moses over the nation of Israel. He was about ready to end his journey, and he spoke to them, and he was reminding them that God had so multiplied them as they had wandered those 40 years in the desert. They were getting ready to go in the promised land, and he, he said, you are like the stars of heaven in number. But he said, may the Lord God of your fathers increase you a thousandfold more than you are and bless you. And I shared with you three weeks ago, that should be the heart, that should be the prayer, that should be the desire of every Christian that God would multiply us, that every church and every ministry, the prayer would be, God, multiply us a thousand times over. Save our sons and save our daughters and save our spouses and save our grandparents and our aunts and our uncles and our nieces and our nephews and our neighbors and the people that we work with. And God, touch the people we go to school with. And God, multiply us. Make your church fill the earth should be our prayer. And so I started talking to you about added growth because that's what, that's what Moses is talking about here. And I also shared with you three weeks ago, I said, you know, a lot of people get the wrong idea. They think if you're spiritual, you can't grow a large church. And they think if you have a large church, you're not spiritual. And I got to tell you, if you think that, you don't understand spirituality. You have to realize that real spirituality, the end result of it should be faith and love unfeigned that reaches out to touch every lost person that you can get your hand on and get them in the ark of safety, get them under the blood of Jesus Christ and get them saved and get as many of them as you can possibly reach. And not only do you reach them, but real spirituality says we disciple them. We turn them into mature followers of Jesus Christ. And the way that you're going to know that you're mature in Christ is you're going to start to bear fruit. And that fruit is you're going to be able to lead or help lead and assist others to lead others to Christ. I used to teach years ago, I used to teach an evangelism class on lay witnessing how to share the gospel with people. And we would always tell these people, now, you're not really a disciple or a follower of Christ until, until you start having spiritual children and grandchildren. Because discipleship is about you growing up in Christ, becoming what Christ wants you to be, and one of the things he wants you to be is a disciple maker. One who goes out and wins others and helps or assists to train them to become disciples who in turn will go out and reach others. And see, if you're doing that and you're really spiritual, just by nature there has to be numeric growth, there has to be spiritual growth. I'm saying all that to you to say this. I'm tired of my own excuses. I'm tired of churches' excuses. I'm tired of pastors and ministries' excuses as to why we're not reaching the world. You may be in a group of people somewhere that you think you're so spiritual that nobody else wants to join themselves to you and you're just a handful of people. But let me tell you something. You may start out that way, but if you really are spiritual, you're going to grow. And if you really are spiritual, you're never going to stop growing. I would that you'd be as the stars of heaven. I would that God would multiply you a thousand times over. I shared with you two weeks ago, I was talking to a lady I had to go for a procedure at a hospital a couple weeks ago, and I was 
talking to a lady and she was looking for a church and I started sharing about our church. She said, I really like small churches. I said, that's not our church. She said, I really like churches where they just do the kind of music I, I like. I said, that's not our church. You know, she probably thought I didn't want her to come. But her idea was she wanted to be in a small church somewhere and it, through the course of the conversation, I shared with her. I said, I know this is not what you think you're saying, but you're, what you're really saying is, if me and my four can find a place to worship and serve God where there's a small group, the rest of the world can go to hell. And that's what we're saying when we're saying, well, I just want a church that just fits me just a certain way, a certain type. I want them to sing the songs I like. I want the preacher to preach as long or lo as long as I like it. I want everybody to dress the way I want it. I got to tell you something this morning. It's not about you. Well, it kind of is. Jesus loved you enough to die for you and get you saved. But after you're saved, it's not about you. It's not about what color carpet you like or the chairs or the music or, or anything else. It's about reaching those that don't know Jesus Christ, that are lost forever if we don't reach them for Christ. And discipleship by its very nature means numeric as well as spiritual growth. If you're truly a disciple of Christ... You're going to be involved in winning and making other disciples of Christ. Now, don't get this quiet. We're pretty good at making disciples around here. We are. We help people get saved. We help them to understand what it really means to be saved. Everybody in America thinks they're saved, just about, except the atheists that are too foolish to be saved. Almost said stupid, Trina, but I'm getting better. <laughs> Too foolish to get saved. Everybody thinks they're saved, but you, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've got to come the way that God's Word says. He is the door to the sheepfold. He said, if you try to get in any other way, you're going to be a robber. So you've got to come through Him. But once you are, that's not the end all. So many people think, man, once I accept Christ as Savior and Lord... Then I'll find me a church that does the music I like and has the seats I like and meet at the hours that I like and do everything the way I like and I'll just be one happy person. And you think that's the whole ball game. You think that's it. You think that's Christianity. Oh, I forgot. Every once in a while I have problems and I need to call on God every once in a while to fix problems. Throw that in there too, Pastor Ken. And then you think that's it. You think that's the whole ball game, and it's not. We are to become disciples, followers of Christ. But even more than that, we are to become fruit bearers. Fruit bearers. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. That doesn't sound like me and my four on the corner in our sweet little red brick house church that, you know, bless God, we're so spiritual, nobody else wants to come visit us. No, that says we reach people. We are bearing fruit, and we are bearing fruit abundantly. Now, Jesus said, apart from him, you can do nothing. He said, if anyone does not abide in me, we teach you how to abide in Christ around here. We say it all the time. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. He is the Word. These words that He spoke are spirit and life. You can't be a Christian and not get this Word down inside of your heart and soul. You're kidding yourself. Well, you might be an anemic Christian. If all you ever get is what I preach to you on Sunday morning and you never crack the book any other time, God help you. God help you. You may just barely be in the kingdom, but that's all that you are. You've got to get that word down inside. You've got to abide in Christ. If my words abide in you and you abide in me, you're going to bear much fruit, he said. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. I could be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. In all of the Gospels in the New Testament, I don't know of anybody that or anything that came in contact with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that wasn't better after he left than they were before they came into contact with him. Except for one thing. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem in the last days. He came upon a fig tree, and it had no figs on it. 
It wasn't bearing any fruit. Its purpose was to bear fruit for people to eat, and it had none. And the Bible said Jesus cursed it. They went on into town. They came back out the next day. The disciples looked at it. They marveled. That thing was dead from the roots up. God is so consistent. <laughs> we may not be, but He is. He is so consistent. He was saying, if you don't bear fruit, He said, you're going to be thrown away like a branch. You're going to dry up. And don't raise your hand, but how many of us have reached a place in our Christianity where, man, it's just dry? You think, man, it was good up to this point, but it just seems like I'm in nowhere land and nothing's going on and nothing's happening. I can tell you why. Because there comes a place after a while where you just take in and you take in and you take in and you take in the blessings and the favor of God, but you never let God use you to touch other people's lives. There's a place where it just stops and you just dry up. God doesn't bless you. God doesn't minister to you. God doesn't re reveal revelation and knowledge of His Word just so you can sit home and say, man, what I just found out in the Bible. He's trying to make a disciple out of you. He's trying to make a person that will reach out to the people around them and share the good things that God has done for you and shown you in your life. That's what He's trying to do. Verse 7, He said, If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. They're carnal people, they're unsaved people, they read that scripture and they think God gives them carte blanche for anything, you know, it's like hitting the lottery. And I hear them complaining sometimes, well, God's Word says anything that you ask in His name, He'll do, and I've done it and He didn't do it. He said, if you abide in Me, if you abide in Me and My words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you will and it'll be done unto you. I pray for lost people, but I tell you, I shake my head sometimes. Facebook is that window into our culture right now, not just Facebook, but all the other social networks that are out there. You see people living for the devil. You see people that are disgusting all the time, boy. But as soon as they get in trouble, as soon as somebody gets sick, as soon as somebody's going to die, oh, won't you pray for us? Will you please call upon the name of the Lord? Will you send this out to all your friends and pray for us? We do because God said, I reign on the just and the unjust. God said, bless even your enemies and those that curse you. So I do, but I can't help think sometimes. I'm wondering, God, are you really going to do it? Because, you know, we have a part too. And that part is to abide in God. You know, we want to be like selfish, bratty children. We just want to be who we are, what we are, get what we want, wherever we want. But then when we need something from God, oh, God. We want you to show up, Johnny on the spot. Well, I don't know about all that, but I can tell you this. If you'll abide in Him, if you'll love His Word, if you will read it and meditate upon it and get it written on the tables of your heart, if you will walk with all the strength that you have with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on it and walk in covenant with Him, I tell you He is a God that cannot lie and He will always do whatever you ask in His name that is according to His will. <laughs> Wouldn't you much rather be in that place when things start falling apart, when things start happening in your life that you need to call on God? Say, God, you know me. I know you. We walk together. We walk together. We talk together. We live together. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. God, you are my Savior, my friend, my all and all. And God, I'm in need. Oh, that's a much better place to be. One of the things that will happen to you, and one of the reasons I know God didn't just give His carte blanche, is because when this Word gets in you, you know what you're really going to want and desire? You're going to want and desire what God wants and desires in the world. I remember as a young Christian, I read the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I thought, goody, goody, I'm going to get everything I want, everything I ask for. I walked with God for a few years, and I finally figured out what He really means. He said, the Lord, if the Lord is really your shepherd, He's so going to work in your heart, work in your life, change you, that after a while, the only thing you're going to want is what the shepherd wants. <laughs> the only thing you're going to want is what God wants. The only place you want to be is in God's will for your life. You don't want anything that isn't God's will. 
Half of us worry ourselves to death, cry ourselves into ulcers because things don't go our way. If it isn't going your way and you're walking God's way, then rejoice that God has saved you from whatever it is you think you need. That's good preaching whether you like it or not. And this is what God wants out of all of us. This is what prayer should lead us to at some point. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. That's why I told those evangelism trainees years ago, you need to have spiritual children and grandchildren. Then you'll prove that you know Christ. Then you'll prove that you understand the gospel. Then you'll prove that God's mission in the earth is more important to you than all the other things in your life combined because you will want to reach others and you'll want to bear much fruit. I love that. You will bear much fruit. I said you will bear much fruit. Now in John 15, verse 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Me and Jesus were talking in the shower this morning. We always talk in the shower. I think it's mostly because he's got more of my attention in the shower. There ain't much else going on. And I got to thinking, you know, we got a lot of churches today, and I'm not condemning them. I'm not condemning anybody that's trying to do anything in Jesus' name to reach lost people. But sometimes you need to think about things. We got churches called seeker churches. Seeker churches, what we do is we unchristianize everything so lost people can come into our church services to seek God. You know what Jesus said to me this morning? He said, there are no seekers. He said, not one. He said, there are no seekers after God. Not a single one. No one is seeking after God. All their hearts are set on evil. That's Scripture. He's probably said it to me many times before because I've read the Bible many times, but I didn't hear it. There is none righteous. There is no not one. There is not one person, the Bible said, that seeks after God. You know how you get to God? The Holy Spirit has to draw you. That's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time building a seeker-friendly church. There are none. You can change it till God isn't here and they can all come in. You can serve them Budweiser, I guess and get them all in here and they'll show up. I know they will. See, every weekend I pass by churches everywhere where the parking lots are sparse and empty. Very seldom do I pass a bar, and it don't matter if it's Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, they're packed. Their congregations are always there. Some of you Christians need to learn from that. If you as faithful to God as they are to the drink, we'd turn the world upside down. I used to be one of them. That's why I think that stuff. I ride by and I think, you know, you can't get 10 people out to a prayer meeting. Well, we can, but thank God. Most of the time, you can't get a dozen of them out to prayer meeting. Open up a bar. Yeah. You know what you hear from Christians? Well, I can't be there. I got to do this and I got to do that. And I, you know, I'm I'm looking for a wife and I cat on land and I got the car, all this other stuff to deal with. Wasn't that what Jesus said? (laughs) Open up a bar, buddy, they'll run to it. Night and day, any hour of the day, pay any price. Even when they don't have the price to pay, they'll go. But see, the reality is, the reality is that nobody is seeking after God. The Holy Spirit has to seek after God. That's why I'd rather have a prayer meeting than a seeker service. All right, now don't go run out and tell all my pastor friends that are doing seeker churches that Pastor Kenny's preaching against you. I'm not. I hope they win people that way, but I don't think that's the best way. You can't change the church to look like the world and expect people to come in and think they need to change something in their lives. Yeah, thank God. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Say, I am chosen. I am chosen. Listen what he chose you for. That you would go forth and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain. That it be lasting. That it would change people's lives. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Can I give you a good reason to go to prayer meeting? It's the people that you love. 
your sons, your daughters. The reason I say that is, you know how you're going to win them? The first thing you have to do as a disciple. You got to you got to pray. You got to knock. You got to plead. You got to pray so many times that one day God's going to walk out through his heaven, he's going to see this big memorial stone that's sticking up in the air. And it's going to have the name of your family on it. I know because the Bible said he walked out one day and he said, Cornelius and his household, his sons, his daughters, his servants. Gabriel, go down and tell them that a memorial has come up before me. Where do you think that memorial came from? Prayer. We ought to cry out night and day for God to save our loved ones and turn us into a disciple that can have an impact on them. And even if we can't have an impact on them when we're praying that prayer, God send labors into your harvest. We can become a disciple that will have an impact on somebody else's family. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send labors into the harvest. He will do that. If you ask God, touch my son, touch my daughter, touch my spouse, send labors and witnesses into their life. Lord, I've told them everything I know. I'm showing them everything I know how. They won't listen to me. I don't have honor. They know how evil I used to be. They know how ungodly I used to be. They ain't really listening to me, Lord. But Lord, if you would just send someone else and don't wait till you're like the, the rich man. Don't wait till you're in hell to start praying and crying out, Oh, God, save them and don't let them come here. Don't wait until this world has gotten a hold of them to where it can't, they can't get loose from it to start laying on your face before God and say, God, please save my family. And God, I'm just going to keep praying and I'm going to keep building this monument. I'm going to keep piling these prayers up, God, because you're a God of love and mercy and compassion. And you said you would do what I ask you to do if I ask according to your will. And your will is, oh God, that I would bear fruit in whatever I'd ask in the Father's name. You would give it to me. And I will pray. That's where it's got to start. And you know the early church did that. You know what they were doing when the Holy Spirit fell? You know what they were doing when 3,000 got saved right before they got saved? They were on their faces in the upper room, worshiping, praising, and praying, and worshiping God, and calling on the name of the Lord. And the Bible said that God added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yeah, i got to get done, man. I'm almost out of time again. There, I'm on point two. I got three. I'm at point two. There are reasons why churches do not grow. Moses really got it. I don't know if you caught this when I read the opening scripture any time I wrote it, but listen to what he said. I spoke to you at that time saying, I'm not able to bear the burden of you alone. Moses understood if he was going to reach the world and multiply people that he could not do it by himself. He realized he was going to need help. Now, I want to share something with There are spiritual pastors who do not understand their calling and their mission. You can be spiritual and have a church that doesn't grow. You can be super spiritual and have a church that doesn't grow if you don't understand your calling. I didn't understand mine when I first got saved. And when I, well, no, I didn't when I first got saved, but when I first became a pastor either. Just about every pastor I know, we, we become pastors because we have a burden for lost people. We want to win the lost. Most of us see things going on in our home church that really isn't adding to that, and it really isn't making it happen, and, and most of us think early on that through the mistakes we see those that are leading us make that we're not going to make the same mistakes. And we go in with this idea that I'm going to find a place somewhere, and I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to be a preacher, and I'm going to preach the gospel, and because I preach the gospel, people are just going to flock in the doors, and people are going to get saved because we're going to do it better than anybody's ever done it before, and we're going to do it right because we want to do it the way God does. And we just expect that if every Sunday I get before God and I pray and I prepare my heart and I prepare the message and I open the doors and I get ready, then people are just going to show up. Thank God a few do. They do. They always do. In fact, if you'll preach the Word, I'll assure you this, you will never be without an audience. 
It may not be real big, but you will always at least have somebody that wants to hear the Word of God. The Word of God is that powerful, and God will use it. But you know what I had to learn after a while? I had to learn that I couldn't do it by myself. I, I couldn't be Superman preacher that, you know, if I just preach right and say it right, everybody else will just show up and, oh, God, and, you know, fall on their faces before God. What I realized was that I couldn't take hell on with a water pistol by myself. Because that's what you're doing when you do that. I finally, it took me a few years, but I finally figured out what my job and calling was as a pastor. It's this, Ephesians 4.11. So Christ, gave him, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And here it is. To equip his people... For works of service. A pastor's calling is to train and equip and to teach people to become mature followers and disciples of Christ. And you can't do that by yourself with one sermon on a Sunday morning or ten sermons on Sunday morning. <laughs> you can't do that. You know what it takes? It takes teaching. It takes training. It takes mentoring. It takes spending time with people. It takes taking people out to situations and circumstances. It takes giving people opportunity to step up and serve in different areas of your church. A lot of pastors never learn that. A lot of new pastors never learn that. They never want anybody to do anything. They don't train anybody to do anything. They just stand up and sometimes holler at their own people and say, why aren't you people bringing people to church? Well, here's the other side of that. Until you build something in a church that's going to make disciples, God himself is not going to draw them by the Holy Spirit. Took me a while to figure that one out too. But the reality is our job as pastors and leaders is to train and equip and make disciples. We do a good job of that here at New Life. We do. We've got teachers and workers. There are laborers that do all kinds of different ministries around here. We provide a discipleship training program. A lot of you have been through it. A lot of you have been trained with it. A lot of you, your, your life is a testimony and a witness out in the community. A lot of you are doing exactly what I'm talking about this morning. You're talking to your friends. You're talking to your neighbors. You've become world-class inviters. You invite people to church all the time. Those of you that put those invitations to our church services out on, new, on uh, Facebook, God bless you. God bless you. Just keep doing it. Do it a thousand times if only two people ever show up. Just keep doing it. Somebody, God will use it. He'll touch somebody's heart. There are people in this church that are involved in ministries outside of our church. They go out into the neighborhood, into the parks. They go out into, you know, areas, and they do everything they can. They do it with preaching. They do it with music. They do whatever they can to reach lost people. There's a lot of people in our church doing that. There's something in church growth circles called the 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle says 80% of the ministry is done by 20% of the people in your church. I thank God that is not new life. We are way above that percentage. We really are. There are people, you know, when we first came to this building, it's so big and the ground is so beautiful. And, and I felt bad for about the first year because we weren't using a lot of it a lot of the time. But you know, now I can hardly show up here any hour of the day or night that there isn't something going on, some kind of ministry going on, somebody here doing something to further the gospel and the kingdom of God in people's lives. That's an awesome thing. Give yourselves a hand for that. We are reaching and touching the world. We have these classes that we teach. There are teachers that are doing all kind of little seminars on their own, teaching you about everything from the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, about, or how to love your spouse. Now, there's a certain percentage of you that don't take advantage of any of that. You don't show up for any of them. And you know what? That's sad because you have an opportunity to be discipled. You have an opportunity to grow. If some of you would just get a little more faithful just to show up on Sunday morning a little bit more regular, your whole life would change. And it would change quickly and it would change drastically because of the influence of the Holy Spirit on you. Now, I'm going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, did you fulfill your calling? Did you provide the means and the ways for people to become mature followers of Christ? Did you train and equip people? And I can say, yes, I did. He's, and God's going to say of some of you, he's going to say, well, a lot of them didn't, didn't partake of it. Guess what? 
That's not going to be on me. I have a responsibility to provide it. I cannot make you come take it. You know, and sometimes we'll have 20 people sign up for a membership class and six of them show up. I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. What I'm saying that is for this. You're, 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 you have slowed down your process in becoming a disciple that can bear fruit and it can reach other people for Christ. You don't have to live a Christianity that's just barely getting by from one moment to the next to keep yourself saved and walking with God. You can grow if you want to and become fruitful. But see, here's the thing. Pastors who are not training and equipping people, you know what God's going to say to me one day? It's not going to be about how big my church was. It's not even going to be about how many people did I win to Christ. He's going to say, how many, people, how many others did you train to do what you do? He's going to ask me that. That's my calling now. I wish somebody had told me that before I got into this. I might not have done it. I thought it was going to be easier than this. <laughs> Ministry is hard. It's time-consuming. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of wisdom. It takes a lot of things. It takes a lot of people. And one of the reasons our church has grown to this point is we have gotten really good at adding to the church. There are new, fa there are new faces here this morning. I'm looking at some of you that I have never met in my life, and I am so grateful to God that you are here. And I'm pretty sure you're here either because you saw something advertised somewhere or somebody, better yet, invited you in. Somebody invited you to come. Jesus said, go into the highways and the byways and the waterways and the airways and invite them in. Compel them to come into my house. You know how some of you ladies, how good you feel when you pull off Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner and you do all that work and you put it all together and everybody shows up and they just get blessed by it? That's how I feel about Sunday church. We work all week long to spread the table. We work all week long to do the very best that we can do and bring an offering to the Lord that hopefully will not only touch you and help you to grow, but will touch some lost person and bring their, their heart and their life to God. And we spread the table and we work. And it's a lot like Christmas dinner, you know. It's all that work and in 15, 20 minutes, an hour, it's over with and it's done. And then it's time for next week. Somebody asked me one time, he said, how do you like pastor? And I said, I love it, but every, every two days it's Sunday. It goes fast. But church, we are really good at adding to the church. See, there are spiritual people who don't know their calling either, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to, you're going to have to come back next week. Somebody called me up this way. Well, they didn't call me. They sent me an email. They said, are you preaching this week? I said, yes, I am. I said, don't you stay away because I'm preaching. I'll probably be preaching for a little while. Church, we get it. We get it. We are touching the world. There are hundreds of churches in the Philippines that exist because of this church. There are dozens of churches and Christian schools in the Dominican Republic that exist because this church exists. There are at least, I know for sure five, I think it's probably seven churches that have been birthed out of this church. And there are people that are constantly getting saved in our services. Seven people made a profession of faith last Sunday. We've got new people that are going to join our church as members this morning. We are really good at adding to the church. I'm going to talk to you next week because I'm still not done this message. The Lord thanks me a lot for my homework. He's like, thank you for doing all that, but I don't really need it. I, uh, he's preparing me. There's a few of you in here, not many, that still don't get what your part is. See, I have to know what my part is as a pastor and all the other leaders need to know. But you, don't, you still don't get what your part is in the work of the kingdom, and that's what I'm going to talk about next week. So I want you to come. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You will never be more whole, more at peace with yourself and the world. You will never feel more comfortable in your relationship with God 
then you will, after you figure out what it is I'm supposed to be doing in God's army as a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ, when you find out what that is, you will feel like the piece of the puzzle that's been missing your whole life just fell into place. And God will anoint you to do what he called you to do. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Right now, I want to take in some new church members because they get it too. Amen. (laughs) Add to the church daily such as should be saved. Would you come up, Pastor Henry? We never want to close a service if we can keep from it without giving anyone and everyone an opportunity to receive Christ as Lord to be prayed for the physical needs that are in your life, or maybe there's a circumstance or situation that you're going through that you just need a brother or sister in Christ to help pray and lift up before the Lord. So we're going to take a couple minutes to do that. You can stand. You ready to stand up a little bit? Amen. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. I was so heartbroken earlier in this week, I just couldn't hardly wait for Sunday to get here. And uh, thank God we had a Wednesday evening Bible study. That helped. We had to Thursday evening praise team practice, and that made it better. And by Saturday morning prayer meeting, I was getting back on track again. We live in some dark and dangerous times, there's no doubt about it. You know, the Bible said evil men would wax worse and worse as time goes on. But thank God that we belong to a church family, and we belong to a, a, a local body that's a part of the kingdom of heaven, and that we can come here and encourage each other's hearts and lives. Amen. Are we ready to go out and do battle against the enemy for another week? Let him know we're here. Make some noise. Reach some lost people. Invite some people to church and get them saved. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Let's worship. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify your name. God, we thank you for the word that was preached here today, Lord. Father, we thank you for the signs, wonders, and miracles that you did here today, Lord God. And Father, I sense in my spirit, Lord God, as we come back next week and Pastor Kenny preaches on this again, that you want to reveal our personal parts. What's my part, God? What's my part? Father, I pray that you speak to us this week. And Father, you reveal that. You prepare our hearts that you want to speak to people next week about what's their part. Your good and perfect will in each of our lives. Father, I speak over your people now. Father, make them the head and not the tail. Bless them as they come in and bless them as they go out. Prosper them in all that they do, Lord God. Let there be great signs, wonders, and miracles follow them all the days of their life. And Father, I speak divine health over every person in this room, Lord God. Father, speak to them this week, Lord, about their part. Father, reveal to us the good and perfect will for our lives. Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. God bless.